All right, good evening, everybody. Glad to uh, have you all here with us tonight. I'm Robert Stearns, Economic Development Director for the City of Fort Worth. We have a very busy night tonight, so I'm not going to stand up here and talk for a long time. Uh, I do just want to thank uh, both of our development partners that have shown up tonight to go over their presentations. I want to thank Councilmember Bivens, who will step up and give a few words for us. Uh, I especially want to thank the city staff and our community partners that have been engaged in this process uh, up to this point, and we are looking forward to bringing an exciting development forward for Stop 6. And so with that, I will turn it over to Councilmember Bivens for a few words. Stop six in the house, huh? I see Jerry. Good evening, and thank you all for being here. My name is Gina Bivens, and I have the honor of representing District 5. And for those of you who are watching, uh, we're glad to have you out there in the virtual land. Uh, my role is to make sure people understand, and I'm talking about the public, not developers, because they know the rules. It's important that the public understand this is not a popularity contest, so please stop having people call me and tell me who to vote for. That's not what this is about. I will tell you, back in 1985, the Dairy Queen at Stall Cup and Berry burnt down, but it didn't burn to the ground. And so from 1985 until November 2013, it stood there as what I call a monument to blight. And I don't know why it was allowed to stay there that long, but it was. And so I started talking to our director, Robert Stearns, asking him, what can you do? Hap Baggett, the late Hap Baggett, was in that conversation as well. And so we tried once before, didn't get any significant suggestions. One guy wanted me to put a dry cleaners there. And my response was, well, that's just going to hire the owner of the dry cleaners people. We need something that's going to be vibrant and bring our community back to life. And so when Robert put out this last, I just say, request or proposal, y'all have all these different letters now. We got more than just some nibbles. We got some real plans. And so things are going to happen at that location. Now, here's, here's the deal. Once that location is revived with development, I promise you, across the street, you'll see positive things happen as well. Light drives out the dark. Across the street, there are bullet holes in the counter where there was a dry cleaners. I've been in there. But Hap Baggett promised me, he said, Gina, I can help with this location, but he didn't live to do it. But he said, I promise you, we're going to need help across the street. And Robert, that means you'll have to get a facade grant and then talk them into letting us help. Now, what I would ask you all to do now in cable TV land and in this audience is just start, if you light candles, if you pray, whatever you do, if you meditate, let's just start meditating on Robert now for his next move because I am optimistic Robert's next move is going to be a grocery store. So are we in agreement? No pressure, no pressure. Are you Catholic, Robert? We'll be burning, burning some candles, whatever it takes to get you going, okay? And so thank you all for being here. You will see me leave because I do not do heat. And I'm done. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Good evening, and again, thank you for being here. I'm Brenda hicks and I'm the Assistant Director with the City's Economic Development Department and have had the opportunity to work on this, this redevelopment opportunity, and so very excited to be at this point in time because as Councilmember Bivens indicated, we have, I think, two very exciting proposals for you to hear more about this evening. So again, thank you for being here. So real quickly, I don't think anyone here needs a reminder of really what we're talking about. We're talking about the corner of Berry and Stall Cup 5401, 5425. This is again a 3.7 acre property that as Councilmember Biven mentioned is the former Dairy Queen site. Again, this is owned by the Fort Worth Local Development Corporation, which we affectionately just call the LDC. And we did issue as indicated a previous request for expression of interest and 
Um, after a little bit of conversation on that, decided to go out and do another request for expression of interest, and that's how we ended up here this evening. We did receive three submissions after looking um, and posting this nationally, so we did cast a wide net as we were requested to do. Um, we did advertisements in a variety of different publications and used uh, social media and so forth. So we did uh, end up with three proposals. We did ask two of our, the potential development partners to present this evening. So just a real quick reminder, the project objectives and goals, and I'm not going to read that, but again, it was really to focus on a public-private partnership that led to a development that could be catalytic for the area. So this is an urban village, so we are looking for something that can prompt additional redevelopment, um, as was already promised. Apparently a grocery store is part of that. Um, and so really looking at that catalytic opportunity. So again, the goals that we identified in the request for expression of interest was something that was economically feasible, that had community support. So again, thank you again for being here this evening as part of that. Um, leads to that long-term redevelopment opportunities. Sustainability, the connections and the walkability are really important as part of the urban village, as well as then inspire investment. So the process, we did have two different committees review. And again, I know a number of the committee members are here this evening. Again, thank you so much for the time that you spent on this reviewing. Um, I do would like to recognize them. So if we could just give them a round of applause because they did a lot of work on this. Thank you. So from the results of the scoring and conversations, as well as then everybody who provided input on the previous survey, we received 109 responses. All of that information was reviewed and part of the conversation and really led us to inviting legacy construction in Innovon neighborhoods here this evening. So following this, or actually this evening, what we'll be doing is each of our development teams will be providing a presentation. They'll have 15 minutes, and then we'll have a 15-minute qu uh, question and answer period for you to go ahead and just hit them up with whatever you'd like to ask them, any comments, concerns you have. We are recording this session. It will be posted on um, the city's website. Again, the link is on the screen, and we'll be sharing that again at the end of the evening. And then at that site, we'll also have a questionnaire for you. And for everybody who's watching, make sure if your neighbors haven't seen this, that they have a chance to watch the video, fill out the response. We'll be asking for your feedback on both of the presentations and the, the proposals. So again, all of that will be at the website. Then after we collect all that, those, we'll collect all those feedback um, responses by June 1st is when it'll close. Uh, the committee will meet in early June, and from there, we'll determine how to follow up, but hopefully we'll be able to make a recommendation on a development partner for the LDC. So with that, and I apologize, we need to just do a really quick turnover on the PowerPoint, so it's not going to go quite as quickly as we wanted to, but with that, I'd like to introduce Maggie Parker from Innovon Neighborhoods. Thank you all for being here. I definitely appreciate the opportunity to submit a proposal, but to also share more about myself. Oh, can you hear me now? Okay, I can speak. Okay, you want me to use this instead? Yes, sir. I, is this better? All right. Can I have my 15 minutes back? Okay. I need, I need all, th I need all uh, 15 minutes, okay? <laughs> okay, so um, 
Good evening again, so that we get it fully on recording. Um, thank you all for having me and just allowing me to propose for this opportunity, uh, but also to share uh, the vision for the site. So my name is Maggie Parker. I am the founder and managing partner of Innovon Neighborhoods. And so Innovon, we are a people-centered uh, real estate and consulting firm, so focused on community-oriented real estate projects. We're primarily working um, with nonprofits, faith-based organizations, neighborhood groups to help them move their deals forward. Um, and so we do this work in partnership with Matthew Southwest. They have a 30 plus year development track record and a variety of product types. So everything from um, kind of uh, mixed use uh, projects, which I'll share some of that experience today in both urban and suburban areas. And so bringing and aligning their real estate expertise uh, with community development expertise to really come alongside community stakeholders and get some really um, dynamic and catalytic projects done. So in our presentation today, I'm going to walk through a couple things, uh, which is just kind of outlining who our team is, our uh, relevant experience that we think applies to this project opportunity, our approach to the proposal and to the site, as well as strategy and timeline, and then I'm open to your question and answers. Um, or I will provide answers, open to your questions. So, um, but I like to start out with like, why do I think we are a good fit for this project? So why Innovon Neighborhoods? A couple things is our interest, right? So truly this partnership of Innovon Neighborhoods has come together to do projects just like this, right? So to have a community-oriented real estate project that comes alongside existing communities um, and really be a catalyst and reimagine neighborhoods, uh, but bringing our expertise um, in both community development and real estate development to do this work. Um, our approach is really to align community goals and then um, in working with key partners, so like with the local government, finding ways to share the risk and reward in that process. Um, from there, one thing I cannot change is that I'm not from Fort Worth, and so I know that that is uh, a common question, but I have selected and will continue to partner with Fort Fort Worth-based um, firms and all of those that are leading firms and um, specifically are minority and women-owned firms as well. Um, from there, we'll, I'll talk through where I see that project impact. Uh, I'm really focused on this project being community-owned and this being a community-owned asset. Um, uh, job creation will come through that as well as increased spending in this area and as I already mentioned, really seeing this site as a catalyst for additional development in your community. So I'll just quickly go through our team. Um, so you've met me here, I have 10 plus years in uh, community development, finance, underwriting, real estate and policy uh, work. Uh, Jack Matthews, who is my partner on the project, uh, he brings 30, he's also the president of Matthews Southwest, brings 30 plus years in a variety of um, product types, both in the U.S. and internationally. Not here today, but uh, Christian Teleki is another partner from Matthew Southwest, uh, a lot of experience in civil engineering, land development, um, general construction as well. And then Adam Miller is the CFO for Matthew Southwest and Innovon um, and brings over 15, over 15 years of experience in um, structuring capital for different types of projects. For this project, we have selected an array of partners. So uh, Michael Bennett from Bennett Bennett Partners is here, as well as Sam Renz from Evolving Texas, um, both Fort Worth-based firms, as well as JQ Infrastructure and KAI um, have submitted with us on this opportunity. Okay, so I'm gonna walk through experience that we just wanted to highlight. So I think, Anytime I've, you know, I just started Innovon, so I'll just say that. It's two years old, but prior to that, um, I was in, in funding similar projects to what we're trying to do in your community. Uh, and so I was lending on community-oriented real estate projects that served a variety of neighborhoods. Um, and so through that, did things like Respio Cliff with healthy, roof, healthy food retail option, work with nonprofit developers like ICDC to, to build affordable housing. Also worked with a lot of groups on uh, technical assistance, so ensuring that they had capital and were prepared to um, receive capital for the projects that they saw in their communities. And then lastly, um, the last year or so, 
I was uh, working on a grant around equitable development, uh, which was then funded by J.P. Morgan Chase, and they're currently in the implementation phase of a $6 million grant. So that was a partnership with three communities around um, ensuring that any new development in that community was led by residents. So under any of our neighborhoods, uh, over the last two years, these are some of my project partners that I've been able to work with. Um, it's a variety of groups from um, nonprofits that are doing catalytic development, like with the Forest Theater, revitalizing a historic theater, and then thinking about how do you look at mixed income housing opportunities surrounding that site, to Harmony CDC, which is the CDC in connection to Concord Church, um, and really seeing how do they leverage you know, the resources of that local church to then provide real estate assets in the surrounding neighborhood. Specific projects, um, I wanted to highlight this project in the bottom community, uh, which is a, a scatter site, 24 unit single family development. Um, we partnered with the city of Dallas and have received $1.4 million in bond financing to do this project to then provide um, housing for families making 80% of AMI or below, which is basically selling, we're going to sell the homes for under $200,000. And then from our Matthew Southwest experience, I wanted to highlight Southside, um, the master plan. So see this as a urban um, mixed use master plan. Some of the projects that you know, are being highlighted here are things like Southside on Lamar, uh, where you have a variety of uh, uses. So both office, residential, retail, but also incorporating um, aspects of like art, um, artists, community kind of input into such a large scale building. Okay, and then, sorry. All right, so let's get into the project, right? So you've heard a lot about us and what we're doing and how, what experience we bring to the project. Here are some highlights that I think are important as we look through, if you, as you consider our proposal. So one is, again, the approach is for this to be a community-owned asset. So it's 41 units of townhomes um, that would be for sale. Um, and so this is, again, for people in this community to be able to live as well as have live-work options, so for small businesses to, to have a place that they own in this neighborhood. Because this has been categorized as an urban village site, then we have taken some of the um, kind of community visioning that's already occurred through all of, all of the neighborhood plans and included that in our overall site plan and design. And then we're looking to provide quality, safe housing and retail options. Our target market, because some of the um, product is live work units, is local small businesses, as well as uh, growing families, community leaders, and then for those homes, um, we are trying to ensure that there are definitely components of affordability. So serving families, our, our guests is say if, if it's a three person family, they're making between fifty nine dollars and eighty two thousand dollars a year. From the design priorities, we're really thinking about opportunities for economic and community development, opportunity for physical connection and activity, as well as neighborhood scale home designs and pedestrian friendly connections. So I'm just going to briefly walk you through some of the site plans here. Um, I don't know if you can see that from where you're at, but basically on Berry Street is, are the um, live work units. And then all of these are two story town homes. You have a linear park that's coming um, from east to west. And then you have a community garden as well as a lot of open space. So really trying to ensure that um, there's plenty of open space, a lot of connectivity, but giving opportunity for community owned um, live work space for small businesses and local businesses. So these other slides are just other views of the site. And I'll just click through these. Okay, so high level of kind of how many units we're looking at. So again, it's 41 unit, 41 townhomes. A third of them are for families at 80% of area median income. A third of them are live work units with the average price range of 221,000. Uh, and then serving families, we're estimating with the income between fifty-nine and eighty-two thousand dollars annually. Okay. 
Okay, so this is a, a 12, estimated to be a $12.4 million project. We have requested from the city a land contribution as well as a gap financing in order to ensure that we are, um, we have affordability component um, and that the project is affordable to folks that live in this neighborhood and also meet some of the market needs. Okay, so in order to actually make this project work, it's not really just a real estate deal, right? Like any time that we're doing these types of projects, we have to think about who is also partnering from the community in order to make any of these types of projects actually work, right? So we try to think about it from a couple different lens, both from a, homeown a homeowner's perspective, a um, business, small business perspective, as well as considering how does the open space get managed? So from a homeowner's perspective, there's definitely opportunities with the city, other resources to look at home buyer training, down payment assistance, et cetera. Um, there are plenty of, and, and um, there are, excuse me, there are plenty of resources to align with when it comes to supporting small businesses and businesses owned by people of color. And so then aligning those existing resources with potential business owners that want to purchase the live work units is a key part of that process. And then from an open space component, um, you know, things like running a community garden. I think there are, I'm sure there are groups in this community that are already thinking about that, are already doing that work of managing urban farms, and this is an opportunity for partnership. From the product development strategy component, um, again, it's really aligning with the local government, seeing how there can be shared risk and reward. And I mentioned having land contribution as well as um, a funding gap that we would look to partner with the city on. From our project timeline, uh, this is a guesstimate, let me say. Um, and so we really look to say, you know, by the end of this year, ideally, you know, if selected, we would work on negotiations with the city. The better part of next year, work on any of the site due diligence process that needs to occur. From there, um, construction will begin in October of 2022 on the land development components. And then um, the home building would begin in 2023 through the end of 2025 in that December. I will say that that home building component is pretty conservative. Of, it's over a three year time frame that we've estimated. And so we can, that really kind of aligns with where the market stands. And so we would reassess that time frame as we get deeper into the project. And so with that, I'm, I'm back to my beginning slide, which is why do I think we're a good fit for this proposal and for this site? Um, and I'll just reiterate, this is the work that we're set up, our partnership is set up to do. Aligning community-oriented um, real estate with the ability to execute on those projects and having the experience to execute and bringing pro partners together, as well as having, strong, um, having a strong real estate deal at the end of the day. We are looking to align community goals and have a shared risk and reward with local government. We bring 30 plus years of experience in community development as well as real estate development. We are bringing Fort Worth partners to the table. They're already at the table and we look to have more as we go through this process. And then our project impact is really saying community ownership is number one. This is an asset that we want to ensure that the, this community owns. Uh, through that, we see job creation, increased spending, as well as additional opportunities for future development. And so with that, that's my presentation. Thank you all for your time. So I think we're open to Q&A, and I think, Brenda, you're going to pass the mic. Ma'am, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. The audio. Is the mic not working? All right. Just hold it close. The project for the $200,000 townhomes, right? Yes. Would that affect the surrounding residents' 
property taxes, will they now be lumped into that project and will they see their property taxes escalate? So you, I'm going to repeat the question to make sure I understood it. So you asked, uh, with the price point of the townhomes, will that affect the surrounding property owners? Will it what? Will that affect the surrounding property owners' taxes, property yes, taxes? property Okay. Taxes. Um, so with any new development, it's likely going to affect the surrounding property taxes, or the, the property taxes of the surrounding community. And so um, in this community and many others, right, like that's, that's kind of the hurdle. It's kind of a catch-22. If you want to see anything new in that area, then you know, there's going to be at some level of property tax increase. Now, I will say that one advantage of, of this community is that you all are in a neighborhood empowerment zone. And so through that, it provides opportunity for tax abatements. Um, and I, I'm still digging into like the local kind of context for that because we, um, I've worked with them in other jurisdictions, but typically it's either if you have, if there's some new construction or if you're doing a rehab on that home, right? So there are opportunities and policy tools to think about how do you mitigate some of the impact of new development that's coming into the area, but yes, ma'am, um, it is going to have an impact on uh, surrounding neighborhoods. Thank you. Um, at the time that you originated your bid and your proposal, you came up with your building expense cost. Yes, ma'am. Does that include the building expense surges that have come after the storm that we've had? Because building uh, supplies are up right now. Oh, very much how, so. How does that impact your plan? The prices, the cost will increase. That's, that's pretty much guaranteed at this point. Um, and so when we submit, I mean, even as you saw the design concept, right, it's, it's still a 2D concept. And so we know that things are going to change. Uh, we'll have, if selected, we would have to come back to you all to kind of update you on the designs. We have to go out and get pricing, right? So our estimates and our cost um, estimates are really based on our best guess at the time of submission, but you are correct. Um, prices have gone up significantly and we will have to adjust accordingly. So that really comes in conversation in our partnership with the city um, because we will, as noted, we'll be asking for a subsidy. And so depending on where our negotiations end with the city, then that will determine where the purchase price lands. So hopefully we can stay in the same range as the goal. Okay, this question may be the wrong question, but I would like an answer. Yes, sir. But I do have four questions. Question number one. This is concerning what area? Stock up and Berry? Say it again. This is immediately concerning the area of Stock up and Berry? Yes, sir. The site is on Stock up and Berry. Going the back corner. how far to north on Berry? So um, the address is 5401. Um, East Berry, 5401 and 5425. Is it East going Berry. back to Ramey Avenue in Berry? No, no, sir. Not, not that far. Yeah. Where the Dairy Queen is at? Where the, yes, sir. Okay. And then it stop, the site stops at the church, and I don't know the name of the church. Okay. But the, the now, church. was this on the question about in 2003, that same area, Stock Up and Berry, back in 2003? So I'm going to have to refer to City I, I would staff. like an answer on that question because I read about that in 2003 because. Well, I'm just trying to figure out. They, they this come up so late, and I remember reading about this in 2003, 2004 about the same area. So I'm I'm just wondering what happened. What happened in all these years? I got the brochure in my mail, so I figured since I'm in stop six, why not just come here and find out something. I just want, I'm just asking a question. Yeah, I think maybe you, in brother. 2003, you may be talking about the Urban Village Program. Or it was we the same neighborhood. The, right, yeah. It was the same yeah, neighborhood. Yeah, so same area. So we went, as, as Council Member Bivens said earlier, we've gone through a number of opportunities to try to develop this site. So. Sorry, follow-ups. 
I missed it. You have more questions? Sir? No, I'm just, I'm just late getting here. I just want to know. I, I don't see much up there, and the audio is not too good in here. I don't know what, what are the proposals, and what, what's, what's, what are y'all laying out? Because I never, I ate one burger that never cleaned up in a berry in, uh, in salt cup. I just wonder what you're going to do now. Because I've been reading about this for a long time. I have. Well, well, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Okay, I'm just here. I'm just here. Okay. Like <laughs> All right. I might not need this because my voice is very carried. Uh, what, what I was going to ask you. So I can't hear you. Okay. What I was going to ask you, um, a lot of uh, young people coming back in the area, including my daughter. Uh, she finished PB and she's trying to get home here. She, she's living in a rent house and it's costing her $1,300 a month. She got an 18-year-old son finna get ready to graduate from Dunbar, trying to go to college. How is she going to afford a $200,000 home, a townhouse, that she might not own? And, you know, I'm just trying to figure out how you got, and plus she's a single mother, and she work hard. She's, uh, you know what I'm saying? She make uh, good money, but she still can't afford to pay that amount of money for, you know, for housing, unless you guys got a program that she can maybe get into, you know? But she, a lot of times she make too much money to get, assistance. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So she's stuck between a rock and a hard place. So I'm trying to figure out how is this going to help us who's struggling already. And then I have seen this happen before. Like on the east side, you say you come in go, trying to help everybody. Then you take all our houses from I, I am Turtle. Everything is gone. It used to be all black. Negro. It used to be everything housing had business and everything. So now downtown has all of that. So I'm kind of skeptical when you come in and say, you're going to do this for us. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just kind of want to know what you're going to do for my daughter who finished college, working hard, got a son, finna go to college. 60% of blacks do not finish college because we go run out of money. So I'm just kind of figuring out just what we're going to do. OK, that's what I need, OK? You know me. That's what I need. Thank you. I Thank you. Is it on? Yeah, was your question about uh, home ownership and down payment assistance? Yes. Uh, in Neighborhood Services Department with the City of Fort Worth, you can get up to $20,000 for a down payment and closing costs. So. Yeah, and so that's, that's some things that she'll have to resolve through in the home buying process. So a lot of times you would need to go through home buyer counseling uh, that would help. Yeah, and, 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 and so the banks would have to underwrite her and, and, and qualify her. So there are some, seems like some issues that she still has to work through that may take a little time. Well, it's based on our down payment assistance is based on your income limits of 80% of area median income or less. But we can talk about all this uh, <laughs> offline. I don't want to take away. Yeah. Do me a favor. We got one more presentation. Number one, she won't have to buy a townhome if she doesn't want to. She doesn't have to buy a new house if she doesn't want to. But we have another developer here, and I want y'all to see what this other developer has to say. Then y'all can ask everything. Now, who's here is Mary Margaret Lemons. Mary Margaret, raise, raise your hand. She's over the Housing Authority. They do more than projects now, okay? We also have Victor, who you just heard from, and we got some help. But I do want people to hear both proposals. So how do you introduce them? You tell them to come on. We still have five minutes. Okay. We still have five minutes. So if anybody has specific questions about the development project, the timeline, um, I think there's some more questions, so. Okay. Anybody else? This is anyone. Oh, sure. Go for it. I have a quick question. 
What, what's your drive for this particular property? What's driving you to want to develop that property? So, um, truly, it is my desire to help communities like this that I have been a part of um, for, you know, pretty much most of my life, right? So, I've lived um, on one side of town and gone to school on another for all of my life, and I've seen... Um, and driving through those neighborhoods, living in these neighborhoods, going to church in these neighborhoods, that um, it takes a lot of strategy, time, and really a heart to do this work, right? If it was easy, it would already be done. And so I truly started my company to bring capacity to um, develop this type of site. So for me, it's, it's really an opportunity to improve um, the area alongside you all. I think one thing that, um, you know, if you talk to anyone else that I'm working with, it's truly community first. So I have to find community partners that are going to truly take ownership of the project, um, whether that is buying a townhome, whether that's managing the garden, you know, community garden, whether that is helping to, you know, point me to who are great community businesses and local businesses that want to be in this space. Um, so for me, it's a it's a mission thing, right? Like this is really truly the point of my business. Um, and this site is an opportunity to come alongside you all and to further the work that I'm doing. I, I think that your proposals suggested that you were gonna build all the infrastructure, the horizontal infrastructure in the first, in one fell swoop and then build the townhouses out in a phased progression. How many live, work, and how many townhouses were you gonna start with, and how do you foresee? I know, obviously, the market will dictate, but just how, do you, how quickly do you think you'll roll through um, the, the product? So I think right now, um, I have assumed that the townhomes, uh, or sorry, the live, work is like between two and four at a time, and then the townhomes are between five, yeah, the townhomes are five at a time. Sorry, I'm trying to remember the numbers. It basically, it's like, as you saw those pad sites going west to east, then we would build in accordance to essentially those pad sites. Um, and then ideally, you know, everything would be pre-sold prior, right? So we're doing outreach, working with, um, you know, realtors that are local to Fort Worth to find buyers in advance, and then that will tell us who the, you know, how quickly we can build based on the interest. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, and I'm going to pass it back. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jeremy Smith. For those of you that don't know me, um, I grew up in this neighborhood. I've been in, actually inside this building more times than probably any other building I've been inside in my entire life. Uh, I'm the owner of Legacy Wealth Management Group uh, and also the owner of Legacy Construction Solutions. Um, real quick, I would like to address the elephant in the room first and foremost. This is not a gentrification project, all right? This is the evolution of stop six, not the gentrification of stop six. I wanna make that very clear. This is about us, but I will speak on me personally for a quick second. Um, my family, my roots date back to over 72 years in this community. I was actually raised exactly 342 feet away from this Berry and Stall Cup site. I went out there and counted myself. Um, I played at Dunbar High School for the most winningest coach here in America, inducted into the Hall of Fame just a couple of years ago. Uh, we are actually currently developing in the Stop 6 area. We have seven in permitting 
at this very moment. And those are just new bills. I think we have three or four more rehabs, and we are currently rehabbing a remodeling restaurant for DJ's Country Kitchen to be placed um, right next to, right next door to Spencer's funeral home on Miller. Um, we have deeply rooted relationships throughout the Stop 6 uh, Not only in my building here, developing here, I sit outside on the porch with local residents. We talk strategy. I talk about what they need, what they want from our community, local business people. We sit down and talk every single week about different approaches, what they would like to see here. So I'm literally here every single day of my life thinking about better ways to enhance our community. My team consists of myself, Marquez Haynes, he's a co-owner, Brian Chestnut, a partner. Our mentor is James Cash. I am Terrell uh, Alum, first black uh, athlete at TCU, actually, sits on the board of Walmart and Microsoft, and currently a minority owner in the Boston Celtics, who are playing in the playoffs right now. A former dean of Harvard Business School, who just had an, uh, a building renamed after him on their campus. Martel Willis, our builder from Compton, California, a neighborhood that mirrors Stop 6 in a lot of ways. So he's very familiar with redeveloping neighborhoods like this. Kyle Davis, it says co-owner, but she's our counsel, our lead counsel, and Rick Garza, our head developer. Our experience, we have over 70 years combined in real estate development. Um, we are currently building townhomes, Top golf. Um, I personally started investing in real estate, uh, first in Atlanta where I went to college at Georgia Tech, then on to Chicago. Marquez is an, is an investor himself. Brian Chestnut is an investor. Martel is making his way into investorship from his building platform. And also, let me go back for one second. I left off two people on the team. Uh, Stratford Lending, Lending, that's a Fort Worth-based uh, lending firm, and Seasons Holdings, they're based out of Dallas. Those are our two principal lending firms. What do we feel like the community needs? We feel like the community needs a catalyst. We want to catapult development. And in this day and age, we cannot take responsibility for what has already happened in Stop 6. There are beautiful homes being built in Stop 6. Two on Turner, one on Pinson, and another one on Mount Horn. My wife and I, even before this was put out as an RFEI, committed to moving back to Stop 6. We'll also be building a mile and a half away from Barry and Stall Cup. Image enhancement. We're currently in the process of building and inviting custom home builders into the neighborhood. Everybody wants to know about affordable housing, but we want to invite like-minded people into the neighborhood to build custom homes and enhance the beauty of the neighborhood, the landscaping. All in the meantime, while we'll be building custom homes as well. Events, private sector development, and economy I'll speak on a little later. Affordable housing. We're currently on track to, in the next year and a half, build actually 19 affordable homes within two miles of this site. Economic development, as I stated earlier, we literally speak to business owners around the community every single week. We have people that just don't have viable space to put businesses in Stop 6. Either they've been torn down, it's too much loitering, or it's just the activity that we don't need where business partners, or excuse me, business owners cannot thrive. So we would like to use this development as a viable space for local business owners. Inspiring the youth. As you guys know, if you've looked over the, um, the development, we are building a gym. We want to inspire our youth, and I will speak on that a little later with some of our affili affiliates that have committed to this project as well. Here's a site plan for everyone to see. Uh, you see the field house on the west side of the property. It's broken up into two entities, this field house, and then the mixed-use space, which will consist of 60 units uh, on floors two through four, 
and on the ground level, 19,000 square feet of commercial space. Some of the concerns of the community were the concrete uh, with our development. We currently own actually a half an acre across the street on the east side of Stall Cup where we can divert some of our parking lot and add more green space to our project. So community, nothing to worry about. We have that covered. Connectivity. These are just a few of our affiliates that we've already discussed partnering with. Doughboy Donuts, if you've had their donuts. Wow. Um, Minority-owned business who was thriving on Camp Bowie and just recently moved to Burleson. Uh, Melvin, who's the owner of that company, he has committed and he is excited about moving his business to uh, the Stop 6 area. Paul Quinn. What better way to knock off that negative connotation when it comes to gentrification than to add a HBCU to the Stop 6 community? They have committed, not verbally, but on paper, to join us in the redevelopment of Stop 6. And for our kids, when we talk about inspiring the youth, what better way than to not only give them the athletes that have come out of Stop 6, but to give them leaders to look up to. The president of Paul Quinn, by the way, was voted number 26 most influential person in the world a few years ago. Also voted president of the year while his college, while his HBCU was voted HBCU of the year a year prior. Lisa's little angels. Lisa's a daycare owner in the neighborhood. She does not have a viable space to conduct her business. She spends thousands and thousands of dollars maintaining and upkeeping her space. We would like to provide her a much more viable space to put her business. Lisa, thank you for your service in the community. Living Waters, what a development. Ms. Hazel, so proud of you. Eight acres we have recently been hired to develop on the water. So as far as that 2007 um, plan that Mr. Stearns was speaking of just a second ago, our, co our connectivity between Barry and Stall Cup and the lake is right here. Trails, bike trails, walk trails, more green space. We actually have the, um, the site control to be able to make that happen. AAU, something me and all my business partners grew up in. With the field house, we want to bring more healthy traffic to the neighborhood. I don't know if you guys know about the field houses in Duncanville, in Mansfield, and in Frisco, but specifically in Frisco, the field house was their original plan to build up the whole entire Metroplex. They started out with the field house, brought healthy traffic in, and, and Following that, you brought hotels, retail, and restaurants. And now Frisco is a, is a thriving, thriving community. Living Waters Park Water, Waterfall Chapel is an amphitheater that will be included with, uh, developed alongside the Living Waters Park on Lake Arlington, where concerts and weddings can be performed. Timeline, ours actually mirrors uh, in Ovens. Uh, we plan to be operable by March 2024. Of course, uh, we have tons of pre-development negotiations and re remediation that would have to be done in the meantime. Financials. Our 60 units will consist of 28 one-bedrooms, 18 two-bedrooms, and 14 three-beds. This is preliminary, by the way. The retail space will host, be the host of 12 businesses, the ones that I mentioned before included. 19,000 square feet, by the way. This is a preliminary cost breakdown of the mixed use side. We are looking at $11.4 million to get that up and running. 
and another almost seven million to open the multi-sport facility. Economic opportunity. There's three things we want to think about, direct spending, indirect spending, and induced spending. Think about the healthy economy that will come from having the three different elements on the corner of Barry and Stall Cup. The traffic that will come from the AAU tournaments, the volleyball competitions, the cheerleading competitions, the parents that drop them off, that have to go get their nails done, stop at a restaurant, grab some Doughboy Donuts and a coffee, drop their kids off, their younger kids at Lisa's. Think about the businesses that will thrive from that. Think about the spending that will happen. Think about the salaries that will be made from the 12 businesses that we will have on site and the field house that will need younger athletes, younger aspiring athletes and recreation workers and supervisors. In summary, our passion for the Stop 6 community is just unmatched. Nobody loves this neighborhood like I do. I can promise you that. Our vision is in alignment with other developments, the connectivity to uh, the eight acres on the Lake Arlington. We've been hired to do that, so we can bring a lot of things to fruition being hired to do both developments. We will be instrumental in the development of the youth in Stop 6. I mean, look who's up here. 11-year professional basketball player, decided to come back home and serve my community. Four years at Georgia Tech, graduate, state champion at Dunbar High School. Hey, hey. <laughs> I'm here to not only help bring the youth along, but I'm here to hold their hand. And my partners are too. They love the vision, that's why they're my partners. We plan on doing things in their own communities very likely, very similar to this one supporting and empowering our local businesses. Our local businesses deserve a place to conduct business. Our future leaders, our future business owners, they deserve a place to do business and not pay thousands and thousands of dollars a month, a month for maintenance. In closing, sorry, in closing, I ask you one question. How do you show your neighborhood that you're behind them? Do you keep searching elsewhere for leaders, for developers, for builders? Reach back into the neighborhood. Show the neighborhood that you believe in them, that the, you believe in the youth, that you believe in the local business owners already here. We have a lot of them. We have plenty of them. 70% of our crew, AC tra our trades, AC, roofing guys, um, subcontractors, they're based actually right here in Stop 6. Let's, so, let's turn the minority into the majority and show our neighborhood that we really care about our neighborhood by supporting them. Thank you. Any questions? I hear all the proposal about building homes and everything else, but one thing I don't hear you, you, no one saying about building in Stop 6, and we are food desert. We don't no. have a grocery store. Mm -hmm. I have nobody tell me anything about building a grocery Can store. A what about a grocery store? Um, we, uh, food desert. Councilwoman. Out to go to the grocery store. You know what, and I don't understand, I don't know why people don't think we got a grocery store. We got Fiesta. Now, I know that's not, I know that's not, <laughs> I know that's not where we shop, but it's a grocery store we can get food from. We got one, so people got to stop saying that. But Councilwoman spoke on bringing a, a, a grocery store to the neighborhood. So that will be, that will be in the plan, I, I'm sure of it. Okay, okay, because we have to go so far to get groceries. I live right I'm, I have to go to those same stores. I go to those my same wife, stores. My wife shares your condolence. My, I'm, yeah. And then we have to go to the doctor's office. We got to go way to Clear Fork 
to go to the doctor's office. We don't, I don't see any doctor's office out here. No dentists. Do we get some of those too? Just put some ice on it. First, let me say it was a great presentation. Second, I'm extremely excited about you all working with us at Living Waters Park to build. But you might, because I, one of my issues has been the food desert that this neighborhood is in. So you might address for them how it will impact them to have the forces joining if you all have the opportunity to do this development and you're already working with us, the activity that that will generate for this community and getting them out of a food desert. That's a great comment. Uh, one thing you have to remember is that nobody's gonna bring a business where it's not gonna make money. A grocery store has to know that they can be um, operable in a money-making business. If it, if it doesn't make sense, S-E-N-S-E, -S -E, it won't make sense, C-E-N-T-S. So hopefully what we'll be doing is encouraging other business owners to, and by densifying certain areas in the neighborhood, which is what Fort Worth Housing Authority is doing as well, we will allow a grocery store to come here and thrive. So just think about that. Uh, and, and, and for me, when I think about inviting people back into the community, that's why I came back myself, is so I can have a leg to stand on when it comes to um, being an example. Hi, my name is Michael Sorrell, and I'm the president at Paul Quinn College. And I'm here tonight myself just because I want you all to understand how seriously we are, or how serious we are about this project and how committed we are to this project. We think Stop Six should have a college here. We think an HBCU in this community makes all the sense in the world. And we are a urban work college. You come to Paul Quinn, you get a job. You get an internship as a student. The economic development that Jeremy is talking about is central to our vision and central to what we do every day at the college. And so when this development happens, you will see us an awful lot here because we don't outsource our engagement, we come ourselves. So I'm here tonight because I support Jeremus, I support this vision, I support this project, and I will support it by coming often and early. My children will play in the rec center, my son will play on the AAU team. Like, we're all in. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. I look forward to enrolling all of your children in Paul Quinn College. All right, let's just get that straight. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Pastor Michael Moore, and I'm the uh, president of Historic Stop Six. So I think a few screens back, you had how the uh, project would create direct investment. Could you go back to that and kind of explain that once we have the one, pro yeah, this one, direct spending, indirect spending, and induced spending, I think that's where we're going to draw the other businesses into this area. But we've got to have something as something along this line. And along with this type of project, we've also talked about having community gardens in urbanization of these type of com communities. So where we're talking about getting fresh vegetables and grocery stores, I think um, I order groceries from online, but they bring them, drop them at your house. The lady has put them in the house for me, but uh, we do want to induce that type of uh, business in our area. So I think if we look at direct spending, indirect spending, and induced spending, that that's going to draw the type of businesses 
into the area once we have this type of traffic flow and this type of revenue in our area. So I, I, I see the vision. Good comment. And, and by the way, Paul Quinn is an urban garden. Uh, they transformed their uh, football field into a uh, self-performing garden, by the way. I have two statements and a question. So as, you, as it relates to you saying y'all bring in building houses, as you can see, we're constantly having houses built up. I, too, built a house in 2004, a five-bedroom, four-bath in Stop 6, and I brought all four of my children over here, of which two have graduated from Dunbar, two have graduated from Texas Wesleyan, one has graduated from Tustin, uh, Huston Tillerson in Austin. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to say is that our children don't have anything to look forward to as in activities outside. So you mentioned the field house that's over in Dallas and Duncanville. Why can't we put a field house right there? Because when our children, my son used to have to walk to Dunbar every morning and he was scared because there was nothing else for him to do except for run on to school. And of course he started playing football just so he can get a little bigger to protect himself. But mama was there because anybody know me, you know I get down with him. But, uh, I don't take value in beating anybody else's kids by the will, but I'm just saying. My mama do too. <laughs> All I'm saying is that I value what you're saying, but we don't have any, we're talking about housing for adults, but we're looking for something for our students and our kids that are planning to become adults, be productive adults in the community that they stay in, eventually husband and wives, and create a legacy in the community that they're, they're raising up in. Right now, they have nothing to do except for to go somewhere else to enjoy something. So my business partner, Martel, who's from Compton, he asked me, he posed a question just yesterday. He said, um, what did you do fun when growing up? And I, I thought it was a trick question at first, because I was like... No, I went outside and rode bikes. He said, no, what did you do for fun? And I thought about it some more. I said, well, people in Stop 6, we leave. We go to Austin. We go to Houston. We go to Dallas. We don't necessarily have fun in Stop 6. So what I'm bringing is the field house to give the kids, and I kept using the term healthy, to give them a healthy, viable spot to come and participate in those activities that you mentioned. We have a lot of outside space, a lot of green space. When I was a kid, I couldn't go two houses to the south or to the north. To the north. That was my boundary. That was my limit. We're trying to expand boundaries at this moment. I went, I've traveled around the world exactly 13 times based off my basketball career. I'm trying to pay that forward to give other kids the same opportunity that I was afforded through sport. And the multi-sport facility, this is not just basketball, it will be transformable into volleyball, and of course, always cheerleading competitions can come and participate in gyms. So this is a multifaceted deal that will serve the neighborhood. But you also said healthy, right? I also said what? You also said healthy, right? Healthy, yes. Lisa's chicken, we mm. have three Williams chickens, and then you said you're bringing a donut place over? Sure. Uh, where is the restaurant to sit down and have some ground uh, meatloaf and mashed potatoes and green beans, something that we can actually sit down and enjoy? Uh, so the, one of the- Besides Dickie, Dixie House. So one of the first things that I mentioned was uh, we are currently remodeling a restaurant for DJ's Country Kitchen. C Country Kitchen. Which is gonna be next to Spencer's, right? Correct. But we're talking about right over in the South. Sure. Area. Sure. So I, I don't, I'm not sure if you notice, but when a gym comes up, healthy things come with it. Smoothie places, salad places, places where that can complement that athletic atmosphere. I firmly believe that once you spearhead this sort of change, others will follow. What if we don't make it? Their diabetes is running rapid. And I can't, and I can't do nothing about Lisa's oh, chicken. Oh, Williams. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't let me catch you at Lisa's either. Don't let me All catch right, you I'm at Lisa's. Move over here. I seen her. 
Mm. Yeah, All that's right. the name. Get that. Well, yeah, name's Chase Polk. Uh, that being said, you said that it was going to be 60 units for living units. Uh, I know, I forget their names. Either way, they had like 200 units or something mm -hmm. of the sort. Uh, so when it comes to that, I'm guessing y'all's economic plan is with all the other stuff y'all are bringing, it'll outweigh those homes that are lost uh, that when y'all do build these up. So when it comes to that, though, and all your other plans, because you had the water plan, and then you also had the, the Dairy Queen plan. So when it comes to all that, how do you see all that coming together? And are there any headwinds? Because I know with them, they just had the Dairy Queen plan. Boom, it's simple, one place, all that. But with uh, y'all having all these different plans coming together, do you see any other challenges coming when it comes to doing those all at once? Well, two things. Dairy Queen was torn down in 85, and y'all was born. That's that, or burned down. That's no, I'm just saying location. Okay, okay, got you. So what we're doing, uh, housing-wise, won't outweigh what they're doing housing. A place to sleep is a place to sleep. Let's let's be honest about that. Roof over your head is a blessing because some people around don't have that. What we have is site control. We currently at the moment own 15, maybe right at 15 acres. We have places to put more homes. This 60 units that we have right here is to direct traffic, and the field house is to, to direct traffic to a certain uh, corner. What we're doing throughout the neighborhood is more of a master development. What I'm doing with my wife and I, me and my wife's home, is encouraging other like-minded people that's our age to come move back to the neighborhood first and foremost, create a living there, start a family there, and then push forward. That's exactly what Principal's Row was back in the day, Carver Heights. If I'm sure everybody remembers that. That's exactly what that was. So, and then be able to balance it all out with affordable housing. So it's a, it's a what we have is a master plan, not just the Berry and Fall Cup corner, but a master plan for the entire stop city. Thank you. Anybody else? Nope. See you later. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking at the total overall building. What is the footprint on that? And I know this area very well. I grew up here also. So I can see that in my eyes, I can see there's going to be tight space. So you say there's going to be a parking space across the street. Mm -hmm. Is that the parking space there? So this is all parking space here. All of this grayer area. The parking space that I was referring to that's across the street is some property that we own, that we bought a year and a half ago. That's on the east side of Stall Cup. So if we have to defer parking to open up green space like the community wants, we'll do it across the street, put a pedestrian crosswalk, and make it accessible to the, to the Berry and Stall Cup development. Okay, so your present traffic flow, can you point that out to me also? So we have an entry point here, and we have another one here. Uh, and we could, could potentially create another one right here. So we have three different um, ingresses into this property. Um, and does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. And plenty and plenty parking. So what, uh, what, when you say plenty parking, have you told number of cars that can go into the area without congestion? Uh, this is exactly what the exact number of parking spots, which I forget exactly how many, that was never my focus, in, uh, essentially, but it's exactly how much the city will require to build this uh, size uh, development. We got one more, I think. Yeah, can we do one more? 3.7. Yes, ma'am. Lisa's angels wants to ask one. All right, last question. Do you have a question? 
Hi, my name is Lisa. How are you guys doing tonight? Uh, first of all, I want to thank you because I have been in this community and I have worked, 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 worked. And a lot of it has been unknown, you know. And it's a gift. I'm a servant and that's what I'm going to do because um, in this area, <clears throat> it is disadvantaged families. And I think what happens Individuals come in our community and the first thing they think is, oh, she need, they need a, a house over here, a house over here, and a house over there. And that's fine. But come and speak with the individuals in the community and see what the needs are. It's so much of people just coming over here dropping off things and not me as a business owner. <laughs> I did with my parents all day, you know, and thank God for Jeremy's, all the things that he's presenting today. This community needs. We don't need house, I mean, houses and houses. We need, we have kids. I have an early learning center. And with Paul Quinn coming, that child can start from early learning and go all the way up to college. You know, instead of that child get four, you know, turn four years old and leave our community. Yes, I left the community, but I'm back. So, Please understand, yes, this is a disadvantaged community, but talk to the residents, talk to the community and see what the needs are. You know, we just have so many people coming over here saying we need this and we need that. Speak to, speak to us business owners, speak to you live over here, you know, whoever lives over here, see what our needs are. So that's my concern. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Please give a round of applause for both of our proposals tonight. You know, I, I think they, they both said something that's critical to this process. Maggie said, uh, if it was easy, everybody had been doing it. And Jeremy says, if it doesn't make sense, it won't make sense. And I think that's the two takeaways we have to take away from this process. I think we have two proposals. They have presented uh, their vision. They brought their strengths to the table, both in different ways. But I think what you've got to consider is that we have an opportunity to make a real investment here at Stop 6, regardless of who we go with. And so I, I just want to thank you all for the time you spent, your vision, your heart in putting together these proposals. And I'm really looking forward to our process and being able to bring this to conclusion and see some construction starting here over the next few years. So thank you all again for coming out tonight. Right now, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you again, and thank you again to both of our um, potential development partners. Thank you for everybody to, for coming out. Now, the key is, again, provide your feedback. So thank you for this evening. But we will be providing uh, the survey link. Again, it's up on the PowerPoint. For those of you who did respond via the event bright, you will receive an email with that link. So share it, forward it to your neighbors. Um, get that out there. Again, it'll be on the city website. There's some additional information that will be coming out. Um, robocalls and um, po um, news uh, Facebook posts and whatnot to, to share that link. So again, until June 1st, um, it'll be open. Provide your feedback on that. And then uh, again, the decision committee will meet in early June after we've had all of that feedback and evaluate again um, the proposals and make a recommendation so more to come this is just the beginning of this particular conversation um, so there will be a lot of opportunities for engagement as we continue to move forward so again thank you so much for being here have a great evening <laughs>